Well, as we all get settled back down into our seats with our tasty treats, we will be going to the Word of God today. And we're going to be going to some various places. If you pull out your insert in your worship folders, it will show you the order of which we will be going and each verse we'll be going to if you'd like to follow on, along in your Bible, which I definitely encourage you to do. If you have a Bible or a cell phone that has a Bible on it, open it up right now and, and, and engage with the Word as we're reading it. Engage all of your senses. Don't just, don't just engage your eyes on a screen. Engage your eyes on the Word of God. Because once again, as we talked about last week, you're going to get out of this moment what you put, bring to it, what you put into it. And today we need to do just a little bit of recapping because it's been a few weeks since we've been in our series over the various spiritual disciplines, faith practices, and holy habits of the faith that we need to seek to cultivate in our life so that we can grow in a life of faith. And as we've discovered, these holy habits of faith are not just beneficial to us. They are transformative. They are essential for us to live out a full life of faith in Christ and to break through the superficiality of our age. They are for those who want to be more than just a nominal Christian. And for those who want to seek a deeper and deeper relationship and meaningful relationship with Jesus. Just to provide some clarity on definitions here, does anybody know what it means to be a nominal Christian? Anybody know what that means? Nominal. John. <laughs> having just I like that answer, having just enough Christianity to feel guilty all the time. It's a good answer, but what, anybody else want to take a stab at it? Okay. Not, huh? In name only. That is what the, the term nominal Christian means. It means that you're simply a Christian by name only. Sure, you profess Christ with your lips, but your very life remains unchanged, unredeemed, unregenerated with Jesus. Something that destroys our very witness to the world around us. It was actually the um, Archbishop Burning Manning that said this. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Something that we've also been talking about, as Richard Foster writes about in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, where he says superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people who go beyond the superficiality of this life, that go beyond just being a Christian by name only, because being a Christian by name only is, being, is not being a Christian. Because we are called to be changed. We're called to be renewed. Jesus came and died so that we would be changed and be redeemed and restored and made new again. But the reality is, this is something Jesus warns us about. That could happen, that we could easily get lulled into patterns of life, into where we fall into this place of spiritual complacency, or apathy, whatever you want to call it. And he says it himself, that we need to keep our eyes fixated on him, or else there, this is just a terrible result if we do not. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. No one wakes up in the morning saying that's what they want their life of faith to equate to. At least I hope no one does. If we're not careful, though, in this world that we live in, that's exactly where we can slip and fall into. Subtly, each day, subtly more and more, slipping and falling away from just being content to know Jesus by name and not personally, deeply know him in our soul as Lord, Master, Shepherd, and Friend. 
the disciplines of the faith, the practices of the faith, and holy habits of the faith help us overcome such complacency and superficiality, calling us deeper and deeper into him. Therefore, if we desire to be more than just a Christian by name only, then a life of discipline we must learn to practice. We began exploring the disciplines with the core discipline of contemplation. A practice also known as meditation. Something that the great author Dallas Willard said, I don't use it as I believe it is the manner in which most, if not all, the disciplines are undertaken. He, he means that he doesn't use it as he doesn't include it in any of his list. Because this encompasses them all, which is why we started here. Because it is through contemplation, not as Eastern mystics or New Ageism would say, to empty yourself, but no, it's to fill yourself with the things of God. To take moment and to take captive God in his presence right here, right now. Have you taken time to just realize that God is with us together right here, right now? That is what contemplation is about. It's about fixing your eyes upon Jesus and keeping your eyes fixed upon him so that we can live out that promise that's given in the exhortation given to us by God through David in Psalm 46.10. To be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. As we discovered over several weeks of exploring and discussing what contemplation is and what it is not, we know that it is to bring his face in view and to stay focused on him. If you're just now joining us for this series or you would like to recap on all this, there's actually a helpful QR code on the back of your Going Deeper page. It looks like that. You can also scan that right now and it'll take you to a page of resources because today my hope is to resource you with as much resource as I can for you to go deeper. And if you want to go back and listen to those messages, you can. They're right there. For now, that's enough recap. We need to move on to the next discipline. In many ways, it's like contemplation in that it encompasses all the disciplines, practices, and holy habits of the faith. You can't practice the other disciplines unless you practice this one. It is a core discipline that helps lead us deeper and putting us, once again, in the place, not where we can do something, but where God can do something to us. If we want to grow holistically in Christ, we need to develop a discipline of prayer. Prayer, as one writer wrote, catapults us onto the frontier of the spiritual life. All the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the most central because it ushers us into perpetual communion with the Father. Prayer is essential. It's absolutely necessary. Yet prayer seems to be the thing that we all seem to lack in our lives. And the sad thing is, it's a natural discipline. Everybody prays. Something we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Everybody prays because to be human is to pray. As Pete Gregg, the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement, wrote in his book, How to Pray, a Simple Guide for Normal People. Another resource that's available to you upon request. If you would like a copy of this book, we will get you a copy of this book. It's an excellent book, and it'll be a, a resource that we're going to be using throughout our series on prayer. And it's going to go a little bit more deeper than we can in just some short 30-minute message. Once again, if anything happens today, I hope you are resourced to grow in a deeper and more meaningful life of prayer. You can also go on Right Now Media or on a website and do the prayer course, which is a companion course to the book, and it's free to you. And for those who don't have Right Now Media, if you'd like access to it, just let me know. These resources are out there. And here's the thing. If you want to develop these disciplines, if you want to develop these holy habits of faith, you need to do something. It cannot be force-fed to you. You have to choose whether to dive in or not. I, as your pastor, can only lead you to the well. You have to choose to drink. It's in this beautiful book, though, that Pete Craig says this humorously. There are no atheists on a falling plane. It is the most natural thing for us 
to pray, to seek guidance, forgiveness, provision, protection. It's natural for us to just thank the Lord for when cloud coverage comes in and blocks out the sun on a hot summer day. Wasn't that cloud coverage this past week just wonderful and desperately needed? I digress, though. It can't be said enough that prayer is the heart of transformation and growing in communion with God. It's at the heart of it, which answers the first question of three that we're going to be asking today. The first question being, why pray? Which I have to respond with a question. Why would we not pray? Why pray? Why would we not pray? It is central to God transforming our hearts, transforming our minds. As we pray, some actually say we begin to think God's thoughts after him. As we open ourselves up to his will and his way, his kingdom and not ours, and we say, God, I'm here. I'm here and I want to hear you. We pray because prayer is our central avenue to God. Like contemplation, it's central to all the disciplines, which is why we should always be attentive to God and pray, as everything we say and do in this life can and should be prayer. I think about everything we've done this morning so far. It's been an act of prayer. Everything from our announcements and praises and celebrations to that just beautiful young baby, Joel, and all these things. I mean, doesn't that make you just want to go, thank you, God? God, aren't you so good and great? It's wonderful to hear about all the wonderful things that God is doing in our family of families. Like just last week where we talked about the International Youth Convention and the young people that went all the way to Florida and how God moved in power. And we just want to celebrate God in that. When we're doing our announcements, we can celebrate God and all that God has planned and in store for us and pray that he would continue to give us wisdom and guidance, that we would trust him in his provision to be bold, knowing there's nowhere he will tell us the step that he won't already prepare for us to go. Our time of singing of praises to God is more than just music. It's prayer. You're singing to God. We have to take that moment captive. When we sing songs like, I surrender all, to not pray it is to make it empty, worthless words. It's important that we understand that we are worshiping God and praying to God. Our fellowship time is prayer. In fact, sometimes we'll run into each other, we'll talk, and we'll hear about a struggle that one's dealing with or that you may share a struggle, and that's an opportunity right there for us to pray, to lift up one another to Jesus as we are here today to pray with and for one another. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. It's also, we have these great calls and response, like God is good all the time. When we're around each other, those things just happen. They just happen. This time to hear from a message to respond from God's word is prayer. It should be bathed in prayer as we pray to receive what God would give us. We pray that God would continue to transform and grow us in his word, that we would have open minds, hearts, and ears to the message he has in store. Did you come praying? Your commute from place to place, to this gathering and back home, is an act of prayer, if you allow it to be. Everything we say and do life should be and can be an act of prayer. And we can walk in communion and fellowship with God through his indwelling spirit as is encouraged and commanded of us by God's word. From our call to worship today, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It's the will of God for Christ Jesus in you that we would be people that rejoiced, that celebrated in everything, and that we would be people of prayer and constant connection and communion with our Father. And when we learn to indeed do this, that what is promised in Philippians 4, 6 through 7 is received, to not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
which as we saw in 1 Thessalonians, is the will of God for us as his children in Christ Jesus. When you can do this and live this out, you'll start to notice all the wonderful miracles scattered around about the day. Just like William Temple once wrote, when I pray, coincidences happen. When I stop praying, the coincidences stop happening. Maybe they weren't so coincidental. Is that even a word? Coincidental. Thank you. <laughs> you all know I speak brain glitch, and I'm sorry. In this, it was once said for the Christian, praying is supposed to be like breathing. Easier to do than not to do. As its blessings and gifts of communion with God Almighty are beyond anything we can ever comprehend. Why pray then? Once again, why would we not pray? And here's the thing. We all have room to grow. Whether you've been praying for 50 plus years or one day, you have room to grow. There is room to grow in this discipline. I think about my early 20s and my late teens when I, I would wake up and I could go and run a sub 10 minute two mile. And I was a really competitive runner. And the time it took for me to get there, it wasn't from the occasional jog. It wasn't for the occasional, you know, once a month, maybe go out and try to exercise. No, it was day after day, three practices a day, morning, afternoon, evening. And the more I ran, the better I got. It's just like Olympians are not formed by occasional jogs. It takes commitment. And it takes determination. It takes some grit, some willpower to actually do it. God meets us where we are and moves us further and deeper and deeper along. My hope is that we would all be humble enough to admit there is still a place to reach. There is still a place to go. There is still much to be learned, to keep on keeping on. And as we do that a year from now, if we would commit our lives to a radical new life of prayer, our entire lives would be transformed because we would experience all the more spiritual success in prayer than at the present. This is why we hope to resource you today, encourage you to keep on keeping on as Jesus encourages us to in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be open. Knowing these commands to ask, seek, and knock are written in Greek in the form of a, a present active participle. It can be understood as saying, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, keep on keeping on, as we discussed last year about this time when we were going through the Sermon on the Mount. Understanding that if you truly pray, pray, and pray, there will never be a moment wasted in that time. It will always be worth it, and it will never be a waste. I think about what Martin Luther actually wrote, um, the great reformer from the 1500s. I have so much busyness, I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. I don't think he would ever have said one of those seconds was wasted. Why pray? Once again, why not? There is an important question that we must move to now. Here and now, though. And it's the second of our three questions. What is prayer? Well, we may all think, well, sure, we know what prayer is. What do we need to know about what is prayer? But seriously, what is prayer? I've once heard it said that it's talking to God. And although I like that definition, I want to change a word. Because prayer is so much more than just talking to God but it's also hearing from God. So I would argue a better definition is talking with God. That is what prayer is in its most natural and raw form. How this conversation happens and takes place is it comes in various sizes, shapes, and forms. It's important to know and grasp this because a simple understanding of prayer is that, talking with God. And this can be done audibly, out loud, or silently, in the heart, in private rooms with just you and God, or in public gatherings in community with other believers. And I gotta stress that last point. Just like we need to have that time of prayer alone, just you and God, 
We need that time of prayer for our brothers and sisters to help pray and surround one another in prayer. It's so pivotal that this is something that we don't just do privately, but we live out in community. And for all those who think, well, I can never pray aloud in front of other people, stop listening to the lies the devil is telling you, because you can. You can. Send that lie back to where it belongs, and that's the pit of hell. Maybe you feel embarrassed or unsure of how, because maybe you're making much to do about nothing, as one playwright once wrote. It is high time we remember that Jesus taught us about prayer in its rawest and simplest form. He taught us about what to do and what not to do. And that's found in Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read some parts of this. Matthew 6, 5 through 8, where he teaches us what not to do, showing us what to do. And when you pray, pray, I'm sorry. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. In other words, you don't have to make it a complicated show. In fact, if you're trying to make it a complicated show, you're missing the point. And the place of your heart isn't right. You need to reorient your heart to why it is you're praying. Because to pray to make a complicated show, to make something of yourself, is to completely just lose the benefit and blessing that prayer has for us. Yes, you speak, but you also listen and receive. Something that we'll be discussing a lot more in the coming weeks. But we need to stop lying to ourselves. There's no magic formula. There's no set words you have to pray. It's as simple as a conversation with God. That is what prayer is. And there's an excellent opportunity for you to do this right here as we do pray with and for one another, but also throughout the week, 9.30 a.m., right there in that prayer room. We're here every morning praying, and you can join us in prayer and grow in your life of prayer. Also, the Extra Ministerial Association has a 7 a.m. Wednesday morning prayer every week. It jumps from church to church to church month to month, but this month it's at the Presbyterian Church, and that's at 7 a.m. every Wednesday. And it's a time to gather together and pray together to encourage one another in the Lord. Those are available so that you can grow in your life of prayer. Once again, understanding prayer can be done audibly, out loud, or silently in the heart, in private rooms with just you and God, or in public gatherings in community with other believers. It can also be formal, even scripted. And I say this because that Wednesday morning prayer, there, there's a person that comes to that with a scripted prayer. They write their prayer down before they come. And boy, I want to tell you something. That written prayer is sometimes the deepest and most meaningful prayer I hear in the week. It's very well thought out, and they're very in, on point of what they know that they need to be praying for. Prayer can be that formal if you want to make it. However, it can also be informal, very informal, completely random. Just like my random prayers when I drive up to Costco praying for the gas station to have an open spot that I can just drive up to. I'm still waiting for that open spot. Um, <laughs> Some may think it's a silly and selfish thing to pray for, but I love what Pete Gregg says about this. Why should indeed, we should indeed ask God to give us parking spots. Why? Because when we pray for places to park, we become the kind of people who worship God for a patch of concrete outside a supermarket on a rainy Saturday in July. I don't know about you, but that's the kind of person I want to be. I want to rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And so... We pray into not just things that we consider serious, but also the things that we consider mundane and trivial. We can keep engaging with God in, 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 in a deep and meaningful way by keeping our hearts t tuned to him. Which brings us to the last of the three questions we're going to be asking today. How do we even begin? Where does this all start? Once again, that basic definition Prayer is talking to God. 
It is the communication of the human soul with the Lord who created the soul. Prayer is the primary way for the believer in Jesus Christ to communicate his emotions and desires with God and to fellowship with God. That was his further definition. I would add, though, as many do, that prayer is also the place where God shapes and molds the believer's will more into his will as prayer invites us to not only converse with God, not only simply talk with him, but to be in his presence and to be taught by him. It is talking with God. As we will discuss these next several weeks and as we discussed several weeks ago, to do this though, we have to do something first and that's tune our heart. Just like we talked about contemplation. You cannot pray without some contemplation, without some, some thought given that you are entering into the presence of God, that you are being welcomed into his throne room, as the author of Hebrews says, and that we can approach the throne of God without fear. Because we know his mercy is new every day. His compassion for you has never changed. And taking some time to just take that moment in. God, I'm in your presence. I don't deserve to be, but I'm in your presence. You see, millions and millions, billions of single waves in our atmosphere have passed through this past hour in this building alone whether they be 3G, 4G, 5G, LTE, whether it be radio, FM, AM, uh, television station, and satellite transmissions, whatever you want to call it, they're all out there. We don't see them, we don't hear them, because we're not tuned to them to receive them or hear them. You know, it's one of those things where the perfect example of this was something that your dad, John, taught me. Um, Pastor Dayton told me about a time when they had ran a new cable from their, their, their sound booth, like our tech castle, all the way to the front to their speakers. And they left 50 feet of it wound it up in the ceiling. And over time, you know, everything was working just fine. And then one day, all of a sudden, a Dodgers game started playing while Pastor Dayton was preaching. Because that cable acted as the perfect antenna. The perfect antenna to pick up the single and start playing it through the speakers. You know, I don't know what happened in that moment, but it had to be interesting for sure. And I'm sure he finished his message up once the game was over. The point is that we must seek to do this in prayer, to tune our hearts to God so we can properly hear and respond to him in loving communion with him by and through his Holy Spirit. Because here is the reality amongst all the noise we don't hear regularly, we are all attuned to a lot of noise that we do hear, which is why we pray. It is always best when we pray to pause, to be still, and to know that he is God. To cut out the noise of our lives, to breathe slowly, and to recenter our scattered senses upon the presence of God. It is no wonder Jesus often went away to desolate places to pray. He gave us the example to follow. Why would we not? Why would we not try to find those places of silence and solitude to be just with God? To pause from the busyness of life. Because that's the first step of prayer, is pausing. And it's a wonderful model that um, Pete Gregg in his book, How to Pray, actually came up with. P-R-A-Y model, which means P, pause, R, rejoice, A, ask, and Y, yield. For today, one last resource and tool before we go deeper next week, though, about this. You can do this pausing simply by using a helpful, ancient, contemplative tool and practice of the faith that was used by many, especially Francis of Assisi. It's something that's known as a breath prayer. Now, some people may get a little freaked out about hearing something about breathing techniques, like, oh gosh, here's where we go with the Eastern mysticism, mysticism or New Age deception. But that can't be further from the truth. Because once again, we're not trying to empty ourselves. We're trying to fill ourselves with Jesus. We're trying to keep our mind focused on Jesus. And a breath prayer is simple. It is simple as breathing in, filling your lungs. And as you exhale, saying something, like Francis of Assisi encouraged all of his students to do, my God and my all. So just like, my God and my all. 
And doing that multiple times, focusing yourself on God, focusing yourself on Jesus. I can't tell you how great a tool this is to be able to just to put away distraction and to focus on God. Of course, Lucas is going to come bar- bar- barging into the wrong room eventually saying, hey, Dad, do you know where this is? And that's when you just stop saying, hey, I'm praying. And you start over again. My God and my all. My God and my all. And it doesn't have to be those words. It could be whatever words. It could be, Lord, make me aware of your presence right here and right now. Lord, make me aware of your voice. Help me to be attuned to what it is you have to say to me. As long as it allows you to make him the subject of the moment and the subject of your life. This is where real prayer begins. With contemplation. And that's just not me. That's Jesus. Whenever his disciples asked them, asked him to teach him how to pray, he said to pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's Matthew 6, 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. A perfect example of prayer that's contemplative. Because we're turning our focus, we're turning our attention on God. We're turning our focus, we're turning our attention on Christ. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Lord, you are so holy, you are so good, you are so wonderful. Help me to understand what it is I'm doing in this moment. So, in this short time today, we've addressed a lot about this particular discipline, practice, and holy habit. But yet, we haven't even scratched the surface. There's so much more to happen. There's so much more to dig into. And quite frankly, there's so much we're not going to be able to get into. It's going to be on you. You're going to have to take what you've learned and you're going to have to ask, how is it that I am going to go deeper, God? You're going to have to seek his presence. And quite frankly, what you put into this is what you're going to get out of this. What is it that God may be calling you to do to grow in your life of prayer today? Is it picking up a book? Is it practicing resting in God's presence before ever saying a word? Is it utilizing one of the other tools or things that we discussed today? What is it that God is telling you, speaking to you? Don't leave today without taking some time to take a deep breath and say, God, what is it I need to hear? Because I cannot, nor should I tell you, because I don't know. God's speaking to you. Do you believe that, that God is speaking to you? Right now, he is speaking to you. We must have open hearts, ears, and minds to receive, though. And here's a promise that's given to us by the prophet Jeremiah. In 29, 13, he says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. That's exactly what will happen. If you truly tune your heart to Jesus, you will find him. And you may not hear an audible voice. I personally have never have. But you will be tugged and pulled deeply within your spirit. I definitely have felt that before. A pull that's beyond emotion. What is God speaking to you today? If you do not know, maybe it's time to pause. Focus on him and listen to his voice. And take a moment to breathe. My God and my all. This is the word of the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Amen.